Over the course of the 20th century, there was an explosion of interest in human rights and democratization. The world witnessed the death of the vast European empires and the birth of countless movements in favor of the rights of marginalized people. In many places, the quest for self-determination and demarginalization was intertwined with the issue of language rights. Language barriers prevent many groups and individuals from being able to speak for themselves or think of themselves as valued members of society. In some cases, they even block access to social services and the justice system. Language power dynamics are a fact of life everywhere in the world, and language hierarchies come in many different forms. Allow me to describe three configurations. Type A is the formal-informal continuum scenario. Even in countries we think of as monolingual, a formal, prestige version of the national language tends to dominate regional and working-class varieties. The rhine in Spain stays mainly in the plain. The rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain. Didn't I say that? No, Eliza, you didn't say that. You didn't even say that. Different registers of the language often exist on a continuum, and people can switch between the two depending on context. Type B is what I call the colonial scenario. Here, the language of the political elite serves as a prestige language, while most of the population speaks a different language. It, it says, Romans go home. No, it doesn't. <laughs> What's Latin for Roman? Come on, ah, come on. Romanus? Forget if Romanus is. <laughs> Annie? Romani. Historically, this has been the situation in much of the world, including every part of the Americas before European settlers began to outnumber indigenous inhabitants and throughout Africa in the colonial period. Elite minority languages still maintain a privileged position in places like Puerto Rico and South Africa. Type C is what I call the post-colonial scenario. Here, the prestige language is no one's first language, but it is acquired by the elites. In Nigeria, for instance, English is the official language even though no one speaks it as their first language. Nigerians must learn English in order to succeed in professions or politics. As in many former colonies, the language of the colonizer has been maintained as most neutral, in order not to give unfair advantage to a particular section of the population. Each of these scenarios can be found in the Caribbean. Because of its long history with European colonization, the forced migration of enslaved Africans and indentured Asian workers, the Caribbean is a particularly complex corner of the earth. If you look at a language map of the Caribbean, you might see something like this. Some islands speak Spanish, some French, some English, and some Dutch. But the actual situation is far more complex than this one-dimensional history of colonial affiliation. In some territories, we find the informal formal continuum scenario. This is the case in Cuba and the Dominican Republic, where virtually the whole population speaks Spanish, though there are of course different registers and regional variations. The colonial scenario, where the elite speak their language and the masses speak theirs, is the case in places like Curaçao and the Dutch Caribbean where the elites speak their first language, Dutch, and the masses speak a Portuguese-based Creole called Papiamento. There is no confusing the two languages. This is clearly a bilingual society. Elsewhere in the Caribbean, the situation is less clear-cut. At first blush, in a place like Jamaica or Haiti, you might think you're in the presence of a formal-informal continuum scenario, like in Cuba or in England. In Jamaica, the traditional elites speak their language, English, while most of the population speaks Jamaican Patois. In Haiti, the prestige language is French, but the entire population speaks Haitian Creole, or Creole, as their first language. Traditionally, Patois and Creole have been described as dialects of English and French, which would make Jamaica and Haiti a formal informal continuum scenario. But if Patois and Creole are languages in their own right, then we have a colonial or post-colonial scenario. It all depends on what we mean by language. Linguists have used different criteria to distinguish dialects from languages. One criterion is mutual intelligibility. If two people can have a conversation, they're speaking the same language. Of course, this isn't a perfect criterion because it is subjective. As an English speaker, you're probably familiar with English dialects that you can't understand. Oh, I suppose later on I'll probably dodge, I'll pass them out or something like that. Go on, yeah, I'll pass, you know, I'll go up around on O'Kali or something like that. Get on the go, I'll go to a couple of house parties, some kitchen parties, you know. Conversely, if two communities have a history of antagonism, they're less likely to even try to understand one another. This is the case with Catalan and Castilian Spanish, which share about 85% of their vocabularies, and with Serbian and Croatian, which are essentially the same language, except they use two different alphabets. This brings us to the second criterion, politics and power. The linguist Max Weinreich once said, a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. Those with power define what is a language and what is a vulgar dialect of that language. In so doing, they reinforce their own power. 
In order to combat this self-perpetuating dynamic, linguists redefined language on the basis of more neutral technical criteria. In the context of this 20th century shift toward democratization and human rights, marginalized groups use this redefinition to legitimize their languages in new contexts. One of the best examples of this process is the Haitian case. In this series of videos, I'm going to examine the process by which the Haitian people redefined their language as acceptable for use in all written and formal contexts. Creole and French share some similarities. Much of the vocabulary is similar, especially certain nouns and verbs. The French word for the verb to eat is manger. In Creole, it's manger. The French word for horse is cheval. The Creole word is choual. But the two languages are strikingly different at the level of grammar. For example, possessives, plurals, and verb conjugations all work very differently in Creole and French. Consider two examples. In French, the phrase, is she playing with her children, is est-ce qu'elle joue avec ses enfants? Whereas in Creole, you would say, est-ce qu'elle a joué avec petite Leo? To say, we didn't see your friend in French, you would say, nous n'avons pas vu ton ami. In Creole, it would be, nous pas tuez amis. There are similarities to be sure, but there is absolutely no guarantee that a French speaker and a Creole speaker will understand one another. Mutual unintelligibility, two different languages. The Creole language emerged on the sugar and coffee plantations back when Haiti was the French colony of Saint-Domingue. It developed out of the interactions between French colonists and enslaved Africans, who spoke a number of different languages. Descriptions of Creole in the colonial period reveal two things. One, negative attitudes toward the language, which was seen as a vulgar or childish French. And two, mutual unintelligibility. One of the most famous observers of life in colonial Saint-Domingue, Moreau de Saint-Marie, called Creole a corrupted French and said that it is clear to see that this language, which is a true jargon, is often unintelligible in the mouth of an old African, and one can speak it much better if one learns it in one's youth. Another writer said that the Creole language is nothing but French held back in its childhood. This way of speaking is easier to understand up to a point than the ordinary manner, but an extended discourse composed in this way becomes unclear and more difficult to understand than if it had been arranged following the general principles of civilized languages. Both of these authors belittled the language and noted that it was difficult to understand. In hindsight, we would say, yeah, that's because it's a different language. The idea that Creole was some sort of simplified French lasted long into the 20th century. A French historian wrote in 1934 that Creole is French, though simplified and deformed, first by the blacks themselves, whose ears could not hear, whose minds couldn't understand, and whose tongues couldn't reproduce certain sounds and words. Creole thus has an extremely simplified grammar and a primitive syntax. It's not true. Creole, like all languages, is capable of complex expression and is a valid tool for any type of communication. According to the Haitian linguist Woodler Civil, Your language is a tool of communication that permits people to communicate and express themselves according to principles of the community that speaks in the So where am I going with this? Well, at the start of the 20th century, Creole was still considered a backward dialect of French. Even though the entire population spoke Creole as their first language, French was the only acceptable language in all formal and written contexts. This meant that the vast majority of the Haitian population, who only spoke Creole, were excluded from governance, the judicial process, and education. By the end of the 20th century, Creole is recognized with French as an official language of Haiti. Today there are newspapers, novels, and television programs in Creole. Legislative debates and university courses take place in the language. It can be used in virtually any context. This didn't just happen. It took the efforts of poets, playwrights, novelists, linguists, and activists to effect this linguistic revolution. In the next video in this series, I will look at how a linguistic revolution nearly took place in Haiti at the start of the 20th century, but how it fell apart after the United States occupied the country in 1915. But for now, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and keep learning.